Next is this idea of a general susceptibility to illness and disease. So for example, being poor may disproportionately expose me to numerous risk factors. We can think about living conditions, neighborhood environment, certain behaviors. So we're talking about obesity. If I'm obese, am I obese because I made poor decisions? Or am I obese because my environment constrained the choices I can make in terms of being engaged in physical activity and having access to healthy food options? So a general susceptibility to illness and disease from social factors that would exist for numerous risk factors and numerous disease outcomes. And then finally, like disease patterns, behaviors are not randomly distributed. And so we've talked about this with the suicide example and with the obesity example. It's important to understand how these behavior patterns, how these social factors are clustered and patterned with one another. And it's really appreciating the complexity of those interactions and how they affect populations. So going back to the obesity example, sedentary lifestyle is one of the primary risk factors for obesity. So this slide shows data looking at sedentary lifestyle among adults years eight, ages 18 of years and older. And it's grouped by family income as an indicator of socioeconomic status, sex or gender, and race and ethnic origin. What we see here is not uncommon to what we saw before. One, women have higher rates than men, or females have higher rates than males. We see a social gradient. And that social gradient exists for gender, comparing males to females. That social gradient also exists by race. And then finally, we do actually see a disparity by race, whereby racial and ethnic minorities have higher rates of sedentary lifestyle compared to non-minorities. Now this is the same phenomenon we're looking at, sedentary lifestyle, but here we're looking at adolescents between the ages of 12 to 17. And here we're looking at family income and males and females. We don't have race in this graph, but what I want to point out here is if you look at the gradient, the gradient is steeper for females, and there is a, but there is a gradient for both males and females. Now, if we went back and looked at ages 18 and older, the gradient looks different. The shape of the gradient looks different. Again, this idea of life course epidemiology. If we were to just look at 12 to 17 years old, it would look like the disparity among, the gradient among boys is not that strong. It exists, but it's not that strong. It's much more stark for girls. But going back and looking at this slide, we see something very different. So again, the importance of looking across the lifespan, across the life course of how these social factors interact to affect population health. Now, I'd like to finish with um, a few more frameworks from the field of social epidemiology. Exposure occurs at and across multiple levels. We've talked about individual behavior, we saw the example of suicide and dealt with kind of social networks and those sorts of issues. Then there's the ecological framework where you can talk about much larger levels of aggregation, cities, neighborhoods, states, metropolitan areas, countries even. Then health is multifactorial. And I can really just go down and list these because we've talked about a lot of this already. Health is multifactorial. It's not just one social factor that matters, but it's the complexity of the interactions among these social determinants that affects and determines population health. Next, risk accumulates across the life course. So in many instances, behavior patterns that are established early in life increase one's risk of maintaining those patterns later in life. Now that may help to explain why we see a difference in these distribution patterns between the 12 to 17 year olds and the over 18 year olds. The disparity isn't as great, but these may be behavior patterns that are established early in life, thus increasing the risk of it's of maintaining those patterns and so, such that they're even greater at older ages. So risk accumulates across the life course. And then finally, we just talked about this, how environments can constrain individual choice. Now, what I'd like to conclude with is a case study. I'm going to read you a case study, and I want you to think about it in conjunction with everything we've talked about. I want you to think about the clustering of risk factors. I want you to think about social distribution patterns, 
the differences between populations and how social risk factors are different for different groups of people. And I want you to think about the time element and also the spatial element. A recent study showed a relationship between fast food consumption, weight gain, and insulin resistance, all risk factors for obesity. The study showed a link between fast food consumption, obesity, and risk for type 2 diabetes. And this is independent of TV watching, physical activity, alcohol consumption, and smoking, the usual suspects that we think about when we think about this health outcome. Now, the highest rates of fast food consumption were found among African American men, the lowest among white women. So the question is, is this by choice? Why is it that these risk factors are highest in African American men and lowest in white women? So again, just take a minute. I want you to think about it and just jot down the first thing that comes to your mind. Okay, that's enough time. So now I want to read to you, having thought about it and having jotted your thoughts down, everyone put their pens down because I don't want you to write anything else. I want to read to you another study. This other study was conducted by some investigators at the University of North Carolina. And it showed that African Americans' intake of fruits and vegetables increased by 32% for each additional supermarket in the neighborhood. More residents in an African American neighborhood also limited their intake of fat when they had access to a supermarket compared to residents in a neighborhood without any supermarkets. So in other words, there can be positive health impacts from positive neighborhood change. So you can think about how your answers compared with the study from UNC. Now this is a picture of your Secretary of Health, Tommy Thompson, announcing the new 2005 dietary guidelines. And his basic message is, it's common sense. Anyone can do it. Anyone can eat healthy. It's all about the individual taking the initiative to act responsibly. So given this, given the two previous studies that I just read out to you and given everything that we've talked about, now I'd like to take you on a photo tour of West Oakland. Remember that the first study I talked about was a study in West Oakland, and I want to show you what West Oakland looks like. And I want you to keep in mind the second study from UNC that talked about the necessity of having supermarkets in the neighborhood and the availability of healthy food options. And I also want you to think about, from a policy perspective, that these policies are formed, but the idea is that individuals are just going to be able to, to just fall in line with what the policy indicates. Now, the policy before 2005 was five servings of fresh fruits and vegetables today, a day. Now, don't quote me on this, but I believe the new 2005 guidelines suggest nine servings of fruits and vegetables a day. So this is a typical market in West Oakland. This is not an uncommon site in West Oakland. There's an overabundance of liquor stores, and I would say that Compared to supermarkets, you would see many more liquor stores pretty much on almost every corner than you would um, fresh supermarkets. And I say this, and I can say that this is real and a true story. I live right on the cusp of West Oakland and downtown Oakland. So it astonished me because I found this photo tour, but I, as I drive around my neighborhood, I see some of these things. And if I, if I turn to the right and drive downtown Oakland, you see something very different than if you go to the left and drive around in West Oakland. So this is not an uncommon site, liquor store density. Another liquor store, which actually is not far from the first liquor store I showed you. This is the West Oakland BART station, which you notice here is above ground. In many of the higher socioeconomic status areas, the BARTs are primarily underground. So here you're, you're dealing with issues of air pollution, this is also not an uncommon site, dilapidated housing, which has implications not only for air quality, but also soil quality. Factory density, another health hazard. Now, this is a community park, which is actually nice. There's not too many of these in West Oakland. Here's one of the very few grocery stores in West Oakland. And I can tell you that this grocery store looks much better on film than it does in person. This is the exact same kind of shopping center where that grocery store is. Notice the KFC, and right across from the KFC, if I took a, if a picture from a different shot, is a McDonald's. 
And so that is, now I haven't done the statistics on this, but I would hazard a guess that there is basically a two to one ratio